morning, the Military Personnel Subcommittee of the Armed Services Committee will come to order. I want to welcome everyone to our hearing today to discuss the challenges of service members that are facing accessing reproductive health care. The Supreme Court decision in Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization overturned 50 years of precedent and took away the established constitutional right to an abortion. The court stated that their opinion merely returned the issue of abortion to the states and that women can vote for whom they wish to represent their values. But service members do not get to choose where they live. This leaves 230,000 service women who could be ordered to a state that restricts bodily autonomy, jeopardizing our recruitment and retention efforts. There's a map that I want to show you. This map shows the states that restrict abortion in red, along with the number of military installations within those states. As you can see, many bases are in states where abortion is or likely will be restricted. In fact, look at Texas, where we have 19 installations, and Florida, where we have 17 installations. And in both those states, right now, um, you can't get an abortion under virtually any circumstance. One quarter of the women will have an abortion before the end of their childbearing years. Of the service women currently serving in the military, we'd expect that more than 50,000 of them would have an abortion during their lifetime. And for many of them, it will be during their years of military service. Even before the Dobbs decision, abortion access has long been a struggle in the military, especially for those overseas and junior enlisted with lower incomes. Under current law, DOD is prohibited from providing abortions except in cases of rape, incest, or threat to the life of the mother. These exceptions are so narrow that DOD has confirmed to me that only between 11 and 21 service members have undergone an abortion at a military facility each year over the past five years. Think about that. That means the vast majority of service members are forced to pay out of pocket not only for the care they need, but also for other expenses, including lodging, gas, or airfare, and childcare. The Dobbs decision will no doubt exacerbate these challenges, forcing service members to travel longer distances and shoulder greater financial burdens. That is, if they are granted leave in the first place. Let me be clear, it is inhumane to force women to remain pregnant against their will. It is arrogant to think that we know better than a woman or her doctor about what's best for her body. It is wrong to create government-mandated pregnancies. And I feel so strongly that this is going to discourage women to enlist, to serve, and to remain in the military. It will become, if it, not, if it hasn't already, become both a recruitment and a retention issue. You can put that down. Access to abortion care is essential to a woman's health and central to their economic and social well-being. The ability to an access, an abortion, access an abortion should not depend on how much money you have, where you live, or where you are stationed. That's why I've introduced the March for Service Members Act to enable DOD to provide abortion care once and for all. My office has been inundated with outreach from former and current service members, anxious and despondent about being stationed in states where they can't control their bodies. One Army psychiatrist said to me, and I quote, even I and some of my female physician peers in the military, with the relative privilege of being officers and physicians, fear someday receiving orders to a state which has banned abortion. Because of this increased maternal mortality in areas 
without access to safe and legal abortion, I would not feel safe attempting to become pregnant in such a state, unquote. That is a comment by a physician in the military. At a time when the military is struggling with recruitment and retention, these bans will certainly make matters worse. In the aftermath of the Dobbs ruling, I'm asking the Department of Defense how they are going to ensure service members and their dependents who can access the medical care they need and deserve. We don't know how many service members of reproductive age are living in states with abortion bans. We don't know if service members can be denied leave or retaliated against for needing an abortion. We don't know what guidance medical providers are getting so they can continue performing permissible abortions. We don't know what updated guidance leaders and commanders are being provided when approached by service members seeking leave for medical procedures not covered by TRICARE or offered in their state. We don't know if military treatment facilities will continue carrying all safe and FDA-approved contraceptive methods. With so many unanswered questions, it's no surprise we needed to have this hearing and give service members and medical providers an opportunity to be heard. DOD must act now to provide the right resources at the right time, at the right place, so that service members and their families who have no choice about where they live continue to have access to the reproductive care they need, want, and deserve. As our military members defend our freedoms, we must defend theirs. I want to say to our first panelists how grateful we are that you have come forward, that you've shown the courage that you have, that you are speaking for tens of thousands of women in the military who serve around the world who are finding themselves in the difficult position of having to make these decisions. The panel one includes two service members stationed at home and abroad who will share their personal experiences. Ms. Sharon Arana and Ms. Teresa Mozello both will share their deeply compelling stories of how impactful access to timely abortion care has been for them. Also on panel one is Dr. Jackie LeMay, an OBGYN currently stationed in Washington State and working in a military hospital. And Dr. Gazela Moyedi, who will tell us how she's supporting service members stationed in Texas seeking reproductive medical care. The second panel will include the Honorable Gil Cisneros, the Undersecretary for Personnel and Readiness, as well as Ms. Celine Mullen, Acting Assistant Secretary of Defense for Health Affairs. Before hearing from our first panel, let me offer Ranking Member Gallagher an opportunity to make an opening statement. I thank the Chairwoman. I want to thank uh, all of our witnesses and both panels for being with us today. The mission of the Department of Defense is to provide the military forces needed to deter war and ensure our nation's security. This is a critical mission. On that, we all agree. It's enabled by the readiness of the armed forces, which is the ability of the military forces to fight and meet the demands of assigned missions. And the glue that binds mission and readiness together is good order and discipline. As George Washington once wrote, discipline is the soul of an army. It makes small numbers formidable, procures success to the weak, and esteem to all. I start with mission, readiness, and the need for good order and discipline because our military is predicated on men and women following orders. At times, that includes going into harm's way, if necessary. The Department of Defense and the services, therefore, should not consider a state's laws when making decisions regarding service member assignments, nor should service members be empowered to make assignment decisions based on whether they agree with the state's laws. I personally believe that every human life has innate value, uh, but that shouldn't make any difference in the orders I'm given. Similarly, I should not be able to tell my chain of command where to send me based on whether I agree or disagree with state's laws. With regard to the Supreme Court's decision in Dobbs v. Jackson and its direct effect on the Department of Defense, my understanding is there was no change to the federal law that covers medical services available to service members, nor are we suggesting it's necessary. We cannot both maintain a functioning military, however, and allow individuals to choose, as some in Congress have suggested, what installation or assignment they can receive on the basis of a Pentagon bureaucrat's perception of state law. 
This very issue was debated during our full committee markup, and one of our majority counterparts joined us on that vote. The Senate Armed Services Committee voted 18 to 8, a strong bipartisan vote, to prohibit the Pentagon from using the agreement or disagreement of a member of the armed forces with the state's laws and regulations applicable to any duty station when determining the duty assignment of the member. Following the markup, Senator Sullivan, the amendment's sponsor, stated, quote, allowing our service members to veto the needs of the service because they disagree with state or local laws could lead to a sorting of the military along ideological lines that would devastate readiness, unit cohesion, and the American people's respect for their military. Senator Tim Kaine, a Democrat from Virginia, who voted for the amendment, said that while family considerations are important in assignment decisions, quote, ultimately military personnel officials make the decision best for the defense mission. That is as it should be. I agree with Senator Sullivan and I agree with Senator Kane. The bottom line here is that allowing state law to become a factor when making personnel assignments is a very dangerous and unworkable proposition. An apolitical professional military is the hallmark of our American democracy. For our hearing today, I'd like to understand how the Department of Defense will implement the June 28, 2022 policy memorandum from Secretary Austin on ensuring access to essential women's health care services for service members, dependents, beneficiaries, and Department of Defense civilian employees. Thank you, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman for his comments. I want to just state for the record, this is not a hearing on whether or not service members should be able to choose where they serve. It's a hearing to determine what we should do to make sure they serve where they're ordered to serve and still can receive reproductive health care. Before we proceed with questions for the witnesses, I want to add that several service members approached my office about wanting to share their stories. Several have submitted statements. I now ask unanimous consent to add those statements to the record of this hearing. Without objection, so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that um, members uh, from the full committee or other committees um, who are inclined to participate in this hearing are invited to sit on the dais and participate in the hearing. Without objection, so ordered. To the witnesses, we respectfully ask that you summarize your testimony in five minutes or less. Your written comments and statements will be made part of the hearing record. Each member will have an opportunity to question the witnesses for five minutes. With that, we welcome Ms. Arana. You may make your opening statement. And you need to push that button to. Good morning, Chairman Speer, Ranking Member Gallagher, and distinguished committee members. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today about service members' reproductive health and readiness. The views expressed in this testimony are my own and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, the Department of Defense, or the United States government. I'm Sharon Arana, a major and intelligence officer in the United States Air Force. I'm a prior enlisted, off enlisted officer with 24 and a half years of active duty service. In the summer of 2009, a week before graduating officer training school, I discovered that my birth control had failed. At the time, I was a single mother of two, recently divorced, and a week from commissioning. When I realized I had missed my period, I asked my partner to take me to buy a home pregnancy test. I didn't want to go to the base clinic to get tested there because it would prompt a profile and my chain of command would instantly be notified of my pregnancy. I also knew the clinic couldn't help me find access to safe abortion. I didn't feel comfortable testing in the dorms where I was living while I was in training. So I ended up taking the pregnancy test alone in a gas station bathroom. My then boyfriend, now husband, and I had agreed that continuing with the pregnancy was not the right decision for us. We were stationed in Alabama and access to abortion was restricted. So the weekend before we graduated training, we drove three and a half hours to Atlanta. The morning of my appointment, I learned that Georgia had a three-day cooling off period, which meant that the first day was only to confirm the pregnancy with both a urine test and an ultrasound that I was forced to watch. I was expected to return to the clinic in three days for the abortion, but since I was in training, I needed to return to Alabama to finish my course in order to commission later that week. By chance, I had already planned a trip to my hometown of Brooklyn, New York after my graduation. 
In New York, I had the access to the health care that I needed and had an abortion. I paid $400 out of pocket, and I recovered at home for a few days while on personal leave before heading for follow-on training in Texas with my two children in tow. About three weeks after arriving in Texas, I sought further medical care after experiencing bleeding. At the clinic on base, I informed the nurse that I had had an abortion a few weeks prior. While my bleeding was a natural part of my healing process and not harmful to me, my nurse said she would keep my abortion a secret and not add it to my medical records just in case. I was confused, and I felt stigmatized for having an abortion, like I was being judged for the decision that my partner and I had carefully made together. I was never offered any support or follow-on care at the clinic. Rather, I was sent on my way back to training without my pregnancy termination ever documented in my medical records. Choosing to have an abortion was not an easy one. And it was the decision my partner and I made together. My husband and I will be celebrating our 11-year anniversary this year, and we have never doubted that choosing to wait to start our family was the right decision for us. We went on to have two more children together when it was right for us and our careers. Our four beautiful babies are a testament to the importance of having access to critical health care including abortion. We are a dual military family that combined has over 40 years serving in active duty, multiple deployments, years stationed apart, missed birthdays and anniversaries, and countless weekends and holidays working missions. And we wouldn't change a thing. I know that if I didn't have an abortion, I would not have been able to continue my training as a single mother and brand new lieutenant going through officer intel school. I also know that it didn't have to be that difficult. I was fortunate enough to come from a state that honors a woman's right to make her own decisions, and I wasn't forced to carry through with a pregnancy against my will. I have put my uniform on for the past 24 and a half years with pride, and I'm honored to be able to continue wearing it. My family and I continue to make sacrifices because we believe in what this nation stands for. I believe that for everyone in this chamber, the health and well-being of my fellow service members and their families should be a top priority. My husband and I would not have been able to continue our military careers had we been forced to carry that pregnancy. And as an unwed mother of two, geographically separated from my partner and family, I would not be where I am today. Our family, the one at home and in uniform, has benefited because I was able to travel to a state that recognized that family building decisions were ours alone to make. I thank you for the opportunity to share my story. Thank you, Ms. Arana. Your, your testimony is extraordinary, and um, you're precisely who we want to serve in the military. And to have anyone snuff out that opportunity for just um, a lack of providing services to our service members um, is repelling to me. So thank you again for your testimony. Um, Ms. Teresa Mozillo, who's an active duty service member, is joining us via Zoom. Good morning, Chairwoman Spear, Ranking Member Gallagher, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. It's an honor to appear before you today to share my personal experience. My name is Teresa Ann Mazzillo, and I am a major in the United States Air Force. My comments today are my personal story and do not reflect the views of the Department of Defense, Department of the Air Force, United States Government, or my current assigned unit, United States European Command. I entered the Air Force as an active duty enlisted member in 2002. Two weeks ago, I reached 20 years of military service, and I was recently selected for promotion to lieutenant colonel. I'm extremely proud of my military service. I am thankful for all the opportunities it has provided me throughout my career. Growing up in a lower income family in rural Pennsylvania, the military represented an economic step up in a career path. I joined the United States Air Force to see the world, serve my country, and complete my college education. I'm grateful I have accomplished these goals and so much more. 
When I heard the news that Roe versus Wade had been overturned, my heart sank. It was then I decided to share my abortion story with others for the very first time. 19 years ago, I discovered I was pregnant at age 21. I was terrified. At the time, I was newly stationed at Whiteman Air Force Base in Missouri as an Airman First Class E3. I was fresh out of technical training as an aerospace ground equipment mechanic. I was in my work center for approximately 90 days. I had no social support system established yet. And as a first term airman, I lived in a dormitory and did not yet have a car. My bi-monthly pay was just over $550. As a relatively shy person, I only made one friend so far. I was a female airman in a male dominated environment and the idea of discussing this personal information with my leadership was out of the question. I felt devastated, lost, and alone. My dream of a successful military career was falling apart before I even had a chance to get started. But looking back, I now realize how fortunate I was. At that time, I was fortunate. I was fortunate I did not have to travel far to get an abortion. I was lucky that my only friend on base was willing to drive me to an abortion clinic 90 minutes away along the Missouri and Kansas border. I was lucky the clinic was able to schedule my appointment on Saturday morning, so I bypassed the need to request time off. This would have been a critical hurdle. It was shop policy that airmen in upgrade training were prohibited from taking leave unless it was a compelling reason. I could not imagine having discussed such a personal matter with my male leadership. After my abortion, I had a whole day to recover my dorm room before returning to work that following Monday morning at 730. I had access to the reproductive care that I needed, but I had some financial difficulties to overcome. The abortion cost my entire paycheck. I had to wait until my next pay period to repay my friend gas money for driving me to my appointment. I was grateful for having access to the on-base dining facility for meals, and I scraped by on a near-empty bank account until my next paycheck arrived. Without a question, if I had not been able to have an abortion as a junior enlisted member, I would not have had my career, and I would not be in front of you today. At the time of my pregnancy, I did not have the financial ability, support, or personal desire to become a single mother serving in the armed forces. I know many strong service women who had succeeded as single mothers, but deep down, I knew that abortion was the right personal decision for me. Today, I'm speaking in support of women in the military who will now have a much harder time to access an abortion than I did. I'm here today to give Airman First Class Mozilla a chance to tell her story. In hopes you consider it when developing policy for women in the armed forces, I'm especially concerned for these junior enlisted members like I was on a tight financial budget who's now stationed in a state that has banned abortion. Many will now need to travel hundreds of miles away to find an available clinic in a state that recognizes the legal right to abortion. Will they be able to afford the transportation and hotel costs along with the cost of an abortion? Will they need to ask their direct supervisors for leave? Will this knowledge compromise their careers or will their privacy be respected or will, or will their situation become work center gossip? But most importantly, what would their future look like if they didn't have an abortion? In closing, my heart is heavy after the Supreme Court's decision. My story is not unique. I personally know many women who have faced much more difficult circumstances accessing an abortion while serving. It deeply saddens me to know that as I come to the end of my career, my fellow service women must face so many additional barriers and challenges to access the reproductive care they deserve. They might not have the same opportunity to succeed as I did. Thank you again for this opportunity to testify here today on such a critical issue that involves the health and economic well-being of service women and women in general. I look forward to any questions. Thank you, Major Mozillo. And like uh, Major Arana, you um, show extraordinary courage and leadership, and we're very grateful to you uh, for sharing your story. Now we'll hear from Dr. Jackie LeMay, OBGYN at the Naval Medical, who is a Naval Medical Officer.
Dr. LeMay? Oh, yes, sorry. I was having some issues. Chairwoman Spear, Ranking Member Gallagher, and distinguished committee members, thank you for this opportunity to testify. Before I begin, I would like to specify that I'm here today in my personal capacity as a physician. The views expressed in the statement are those of myself and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the Department of the Navy, Department of Defense, or United States government. I'm Dr. Jacqueline LeMay. I'm an active duty Navy gynecologic surgeon and obstetrician and have fellowship training in fam complex family planning. I have been on active duty for 21 years and prior to specializing, I spent five years in an operational environment as a flight surgeon, including deploying to Afghanistan with the Marines. Both during my time as a flight surgeon and even more so as an OBGYN, I have seen how abortion restrictions impact our service women and active duty families. Active duty women face unique challenges in obtaining full scope reproductive health care, and witnessing this led me both to change my specialty to OBGYN as well as to pursue additional training in complex family planning. I'm honored to be here today alongside my fellow panelists as they share their personal stories. Abortion care is a part of the full spectrum of reproductive health care and should be available to access no matter one's reason for needing that care. One of the hardest things I do as a physician is tell a family that there is something wrong with their pregnancy. I've had to explain to patients that while ending their pregnancy early was a medical option, it was not something that I could legally provide as a military physician, and I have cried with families after their baby was born and pronounced dead soon afterwards. One person who comes to mind is the wife of an enlisted airman, someone who gave me her consent to share her story today. This was their second overseas tour far away from family. I still remember the look on the maternal fetal medicine specialist's face when she walked into my office and asked me to join her in talking with the couple about the anomalies she'd seen and their options. Their daughter, Scarlett, had severe malformations that meant she was unlikely to survive until delivery. My patient asked about ending the pregnancy and we talked about the ways this could be done. I then had to tell them that legally, since her life was not at risk, I was unable to offer her that option in a military facility and it would not be covered by her health insurance. If she wanted to end the pregnancy, she would have to return to the States and pay for the procedure with no assistance from TRICARE. Her care would cost thousands of dollars, plus the cost of international plane tickets, hotel rooms, and other expenses. There was no way this young enlisted family had the means for that undertaking. Thankfully, she had an amazing friend who set up a fundraiser for the family, and within a few days, they had an overwhelming response and enough money to access the care she needed. When she returned, she told me that everyone in the clinic was wonderful, but she wished that I had been the one that had been there with her throughout this entire process. While my patient in this case was able to get the care she needed, so many of my patients do not. They should not have to share their stories publicly or ask for financial help from strangers. Time is also a concern. For active duty women, they must request leave from their commanding officer, who may deny it or ask for details, forcing them to disclose their personal medical information to someone who is not actually involved in their medical care. I worry about my patients no longer being able to access the care based on where they're stationed. As active duty members, we do not get to choose where we live. We have volunteered to protect our country and we move every few years from state to state and often overseas to fulfill that mission. We cannot choose the laws under which we are held, depending on our duty station. Our health care as military members and dependents should not be based on the current duty station, but on consistent federal standard of care for military members and their dependents. In closing, I want to share how thankful I am for the recent memo from, uh, from Mr. Cisneros reaffirming that we in military medicine can and will continue to provide reproductive health care within the scope of federal legislation, but more needs to be done. I urge you to provide federal protection to both patients and physicians who provide these legal and needed services on federal land. I would urge you to go even further. While I truly hope to see the Hyde Amendment overturned, at the very least, I urge Congress to remove the restrictions that do not allow patients to self-pay for abortion procedures at military treatment facilities as it exists for many other procedures covered by TRICARE. Preventing the same option for abortion services is not only discriminatory, it impacts the readiness of our armed services, and I fear the impact will worsen with unequal state restrictions 
that force patients to travel long distances and take leave to obtain the care they deserve and so desperately need. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. LeMay, for your um, profound comments. Um, we now welcome Dr. Gazela Moyadi. She is a Texas-based civilian OBGYN who services uh, service members. Welcome. Good morning. My name is Dr. Gazela Moyadi, and I use she, her pronouns. I'm a board-certified OBGYN, a child of Iranian immigrants, a mom, a Texan, and a proud abortion provider. I serve on the board of directors for Physicians for Reproductive Health and Texas Equal Access Fund. Abortion is essential health care. Every person in our country has the human right to decide for themselves when and if to start a family. And that includes members of the armed forces. As an OBGYN, I know firsthand that safe birth, healthy families, and thriving communities require access to abortion care. Abortion bans disproportionately harm structurally oppressed communities and members of the armed forces. Service members and their families are often far from their homes, young and living on low incomes. Few have the resources needed to emergently access time-sensitive abortion care. While I can talk at length about the impacts of abortion bans on the many communities that I serve, today I will speak about my experiences caring for members of the military. Before becoming a physician, I worked for an abortion provider in Austin near Fort Hood. We routinely cared for service members and I witnessed the countless obstacles they endured to receive abortion care. They struggle to obtain leave for procedures, get rides to Austin from base, pay for their care, and even get a referral on where to go. Because of the culture created by unjust policies like the Hyde Amendment, the ability to find our clinic often depended on one person on base who was willing to secretly give people our brochure. Essential health care for our armed forces hinged on a whisper network. For those who did manage to find us, I can't even begin to describe the pain mm -hmm. service members expressed when we would explain, your TRICARE won't cover this. You'll have to pay out of pocket. After becoming a physician, I spent part of my training in gynecologic surgery on base at Fort Bliss. From previously working near Fort Hood, I remembered caring for countless sexual assault survivors at our clinic, even though they technically should have been able to receive that care on base. Once at Fort Bliss, I realized the problem. To actually access abortion care on base, everything must line up perfectly for the survivor. I was only able to care for one such person at Fort Bliss. Thankfully, her commanding officer was supportive, so she was able to obtain the necessary authorization for her abortion. As members of this committee know, it can be incredibly daunting for a service member to report an assault committed by a another member of the military. I was grateful that everything worked out for this patient to get the care she needed, but this is not how healthcare should work for members of our military. After residency, I did fellowship in Hawaii, a state with a large military population and a critical healthcare destination for service members stationed in Asia. Hawaii has excellent abortion access and many residents can receive financial and transportation coverage for their care. That is, except those members of the military. I will never forget weeping after sitting with an enlisted service member who needed to count out quarters to afford her care. She asked me what parts of pain management she could forego so she could afford her abortion. She assured me she was strong enough to not need pain medication. I was changed forever bearing witness to that injustice. I remember another patient who was raped by a fellow service member while stationed in Asia. Feeling unsafe, she could not report or seek help from her commanding officer. She couldn't find care where she was stationed and it took several weeks to be able to fly to Hawaii for care. Because of the significant violence she endured, she would have ideally had her abortion under deep sedation, which is not a requirement for safe abortion, but might be necessary for trauma survivors. But access to anesthesia makes the cost of care considerably higher, sometimes over $10,000. Since she was paying out of pocket, she had her abortion with just numbing medicine in our clinic. While I provided skilled and compassionate care, it was devastating to see someone dedicated to serving our country abandoned by it. We wept together after her procedure. I was honored to be trusted with her care and she should have never been forced to come all the way to me to access her right to, to an abortion. 
I'll end by saying that we should all be incredibly angry at the systematic denial of reproductive autonomy that is happening to millions of people in our country as we meet today. Nobody deserves to suffer the indignity of counting quarters to pay for medical care, foregoing medication to alleviate pain, traveling thousands of miles for basic health care, or having whispered conversations about where or how to access care. These things happen every day to our service members and to civilians in every one of your states. I envision a world where everyone has access to culturally relevant abortion care in their own communities. This committee's jurisdiction is the armed forces, so I will say I will implore each of you to at least make this world a reality for our service members. Thank you for having me today. Thank you, doctor. Um, again, extraordinary testimony. Uh, and it, it pains me, as I'm sure it pains many of us, to hear these stories, but they're real stories, um, paying extraordinary sums of money to travel and get an abortion because they can't access an abortion at a medical treatment facility. And to look at the states, again, that have basically banned all abortions and have criminalized the providers for giving women abortions um, is also compelling as well. Uh, let me start with um, asking uh, the two physicians this. One of the um, letters that I received was from an army psychiatrist, and she wrote, the risk of postpartum depression can be particularly high for unwanted or unplanned pregnancies and for women under significant stress. Military women are known to have higher rates of unintended pregnancy, um, oftentimes 125% um, of the regular population. And they may face unique stressors related to an unplanned pregnancy, including the physical and emotional stress of their work, the effect of pregnancy on one's career, and the difficulties obtaining adequate childcare for long and unpredictable work hours. Military women are therefore understandably concerned about access to reproductive health care. Even before Roe was overturned, I worked with female patients distraught about receiving orders to post in Texas after the Texas Heartbeat Act was passed. Some of these women are already in a fragile emotional state and have the self-awareness to realize they are currently unequipped to weather the mental and physical stress of pregnancy, much less motherhood. Others have prescribed medications contraindicated in pregnancy, but essential to their mental stability. Female service members may lack the financial means to travel for an abortion. They require permission from their chain of command, even for weekend travel, if it is beyond a certain radius. And they may not trust the military to protect their privacy should they request such travel to obtain an abortion. Even I and some of my female physician peers in the military, with the relative privilege of being officers and physicians, fear someday receiving orders to a state which has banned abortion. Because of the increased maternal mortality in areas without access to safe and legal abortion, I would not feel safe attempting to become pregnant in such a state. So Dr. LeMay and Dr. Moyadi, um, that's a pretty extraordinary statement from a psychiatrist, a ba behavioral health provider, about the impacts of state restrictions on health care for service women. As OBGYNs, what are your assessments of the impact of Dobbs' decision on the ability of military and civilian health care providers to provide care to military personnel? I can take this one if you want, Dr. Moyetti. Um, thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, while the recent statement from the Undersecretary makes it clear that we in military medicine can and will continue to provide health care um, under current federal legislations, there are still many questions that remain both for patients and for providers in various locations. I'm lucky I'm currently stationed in Washington State, so nothing changes for me. But for some of my colleagues who are stationed in Texas or Florida or Georgia or overseas, there are questions, most physicians live out in town. So there are questions on if they provide an abortion procedure that is legally allowed, but then go home, can they be arrested? Can they be tried with something? And who's going to help them pay for that? Because that the cost of that can be devastating. The same question 
um, exists for many of our patients. If they get a legal abortion procedure on base, but live in one of these more restricted areas and have bleeding or concerns and go to the emergency room, are they going to be arrested and prosecuted for something that they legally obtained on base? Um, I think that that is one of the questions that still exists and one of the fears that I have heard uh, both from patients and from my colleagues who are in more restricted areas um, over the, the last month or so. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Moyadi. Thank you. And, you know, I'll, I'll add from what you heard in my testimony and what from the other witnesses have testified today, the majority of abortion care provided for members of the military does not happen on base. It happens off base. So when we're talking about a state like Texas, that means that no one right now that is stationed here has access to abortion care. The nearest states, right? What, what are we talking about? Oklahoma doesn't have abortion care anymore. Arkansas doesn't have abortion care anymore. Alabama doesn't have abortion care anymore. And so we're not just talking about going over to the next city now, which was already a huge hurdle for many, many members of the military, but we're talking about traveling hundreds, thousands of miles to be able to get what is very basic, simple, safe, essential health care. A first trimester abortion takes about three to five minutes to complete, but someone from Texas stationed at Fort Hood might travel for two days to be able to access that procedure now. Thank you. Um, Major Arana and Major Mazzillo, what are some of the barriers facing service women who seek an abortion? And what have you heard from service members about their concerns about being stationed in a state that bans abortion? Morning. Thank you for the question. So, um, ma'am, for non-TRICARE covered abortions, there's minimal to no support. Um, while recent changes in the Air Force instructions removed the need for commander's approval for the procedure, members are still left with the burden of taking personal time off, paying for travel, um, out-of-pocket expenses for the procedure as well. The, these restrictions also, as mentioned earlier, disproportionately affect training bases where members have less access to resources and experience additional barriers to travel or leave due to their training status. Major Mazzillo. Thank you, ma'am. I would say the challenges are extremely worse today. The bi-monthly base pay of an E1 with less than two years of service is a little over $900. Mm -hmm. Even if this service member is ultimately able to reach a clinic, they're going to face significantly longer wait times, increased costs due to the travel, the lodging, the childcare, and more expensive procedures. They could require multiple trips to the clinic and this would add more and more costs, not to mention more and more time off. How many levels of leadership will the leave requests need to go through? I'm so concerned about their privacy and mental health. Can our junior members afford these costs? Do you think that this is going to discourage women from serving in the military? Absolutely. Ma'am, yes. Yes. Ma just yesterday, I shared this uh, uh, hearing with one of my coworkers, a fellow service member, a man. Um, he shared with me that his wife needed an abortion after an ectopic pregnancy. He stated without timely access to this life-saving procedure, his wife could have died. To see this strong individual, a friend, stand in the hallway with almost having tears in his eyes while he recounted this story, it was so impactful. He could have been an active duty service member with a small child and a widow. This was prior to the reversal of Roe versus Wade. We further discussed the concerns and what if he was stationed in a state that now bans all abortions. Access to reproductive care matters to the life of fellow military members and our families, both male and female, and this court's decision affects us all. Again, thank you both for your extraordinary participation today. Uh, I now yield to the ranking member. Thank you. Um, I, I think we all agree that the assignment process, uh, and first of all, thank you all for, for, again, for being here and sharing your stories. Um, uh, the assignment process is the means by which the military makes sure it has people in the right assignments to meet its mission requirements, both in the continental United States 
and abroad. So the services write orders to unit X for a service member to go into a billet or a job because there's a military essential task that requires specific skills and knowledge. So looking to the future, let's say you were given the choice uh, to be assigned, and I guess I would ask both uh, Ms. Arana and uh, Ms. Mozillo and, and Dr. LeMay this question. Um, if, you, if you're given the choice to be assigned to an installation based on laws that were favorable to your political beliefs, whether it's a pro-life state or a pro-choice state or something else, let's say a state had a concealed carry law that you didn't agree with or, or there's another issue out there. Or maybe there's an office in DOD that's creating an assignment matrix of red and blue states based on existing policies. I mean, as I've articulated, I think the potential ramifications for that um, and for, for DOD and the services trying to manage a system like that and for service members that now need to put sort of politics in their service assignment equation gets unworkable pretty quickly. So I guess my question is whether you think that that personal preference for an assignment should supersede a validated military requirement for your service to assign you where they need you, if that makes sense. Start with you, Ms. Arana. Thank you, sir. So again, we're not talking about assignments and the assignment process here, and I do believe that at the end of the day, it's um, the needs of the military, um, because that's why I'm here, and that's why I serve. Um, I do believe, though, that as I, a serving member, I am also owed a standard of care. And if we talk about access to health care and standardized health care, that shouldn't change based on the state that I am stationed. I have four daughters, and I would hesitate to take any of them to a state where I know that their bodily autonomy is not going to be respected. I don't believe that this is a um, political issue, as you stated earlier. I believe that a person's health care should be a discussion between the member and their medical provider. Health care shouldn't be politicized. I shouldn't have to be here today telling my private story in this very public forum. But I am here today in the hopes that by telling my story, I humanize this issue and, and bring to light, highlight that healthcare is not a political issue and it's not about political leanings. It is about understanding that everyone has the right to comprehensive medical care to include abortion access. And I hope that with this discussion and with this hearing, we can redirect this conversation and understand or accept that the welfare, safety of our service members and their families that are also affected by these policies become the priority. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Mozillo. Thank you for your question. Um, this is a, a question of health care, not political views. So I can say without a, a without a question, if I had not access to an abortion as a junior enlisted service member, I would have not have served in your military for the last 20 years. A service woman's access to reproductive care should not depend on what state they are stationed to. Texas, Arizona, Florida, Georgia, Ohio, South Dakota, Oklahoma, Missouri, Arkansas, Mississippi, Alabama, and South Carolina. They're all homes of large military installations, and now they almost fully or almost ban abortions. Please think of the story I just told you about that male service coworker. This makes me fear for all my fellow service members. I'm sharing my story because I care about access to safe reproductive care, not political views. And I care about my sisters in the armed forces. I believe we all deserve this right, no matter what, state, what state the military sends us to. As service members, we defend your freedoms. Please defend mine and my access to reproductive care. Thank you. Thank you. I only have 30 seconds left, so I apologize to other witnesses. Unfortunately, I think, I mean, healthcare the reality is, is an intensely political issue, in so much as the political process is how we make decisions on how healthcare should be provided. And that's what we're working through right now, very thorny questions about healthcare should be provided. And the reason I focus on this issue of um, assignments and whether uh, service member preference should supersede uh, the law of the land is that is what was initially suggested by the Pentagon. And that is what occasioned the debate in this committee and in the Senate. And that's what we're trying to work through uh, in good faith uh, right now. So I look forward to the day when there's, a, a, I guess, a less politicized discussion 
on health care. Uh, but it's been my observation in, in six years of being here that it's a very, very difficult topic that requires us to, to talk about it through the political process. I'm out of time. I apologize. I thank the gentleman. Um, I have a, a question. Uh, do you think that service members should have to take personal leave in order to access the health care that's not available to them at their military treatment facility? Oh, this is a question for me. Yes. Do I think that service members should have to take personal leave in order to access, to get, like to go get an abortion in a state where it's legal? Correct. Well, in the current system right now, would it be illegal for, some, for the command to grant them leave to get that, to get an abortion in a different state? I don't, but, well, we can ask that certainly of um, the undersecretary, but I think it's the, the fact that we don't offer the health care at the military treatment facility where they are means that they then have to take um, they, their, what leave they have and use it to get health care, which seems like it's, uh, w once again, another punitive step. And I, I think... I think you and I are on the same page when you talk about there shouldn't be an ability to pick the state in which you serve. But we have 102 installations right now on that map, mm -hmm. 102 installations in the United States that will, in which the states ban, totally ban, access to abortion care. I mean, that's an extraordinary number. We have another 29 installations where they're about to ban abortions. So, you know, we've got to take a step back and recognize that um, you can't, on top of forcing these service members to go large distances to get an abortion, that we're then going to penalize them with the costs associated with the travel and lose their vacation time, what little there is. I mean, we're, we're creating a real incentive for women not to serve, and in some respects, it's almost an insidious effort to encourage women to leave the military, and that's the last thing that I want to say. say I, think, I think what we're trying to do here today, and obviously we have d disagreements on both sides of the, on this issue, and I'm not sort of, you know, I hope you appreciate the spirit in which I'm engaging this debate, is to work through all of these, these uh, the issues and understand what the DOD's proposed policy is, uh, understand all of the issues associated with a, a post uh, Dobbs role. Uh, my understanding in that particular instance, it, it, I think, and Glenn, you can correct me, one issue is that it, it would run into the Hyde Amendment, right? I mean, we would then have to fund the actual. Potentially. 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 But again, that's what, that's what we're working through here today, I, th I think, in good faith. Okay. So. All right. I thank you for that interchange. Um, I now um, recognize Ms. Houlihan for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I really do appreciate the, the spirit of the conversation. I was that one person who voted on the other side of the aisle that said that we shouldn't be able to pick where we're serving. I served uh, in the military myself, my dad and my grandfather, more than 30 year careers, each of them as well. And I remember being a young girl uh, moving around almost every single year. And my father would say, we don't get to pick you know, where we're going. And so I really, really appreciate Ms. Ariana, Arana. I think you and I share that sort of sense of the uh, the needs of the military uh, drive where it is that we need to be. But I am so enormously compelled and appreciative of your testimony, both of you, uh, because when I served, I was a young mother as well. And I remember having very limited leave and not being able to travel. I cannot remember, it was such a long time ago, whether it was 90 miles or 90 minutes without having to request leave. Uh, and so that would have certainly limited my opportunities had I needed to make those kinds of decisions uh, for my own health care. And I'm also wondering back to my own mother, uh, who was an, uh, a military, a Navy mom, as well as my grandmother, Navy mom, 
and they had their children, in my grandmother's case, seven children, in my mom's case, two, um, what the sorts of decisions and choices that they may have had to make while they were uh, naval moms as well. So I thank you very much for your bravery and your uh, enormously compassionate and articulate um, expression of this personal uh, journey that you've been on. Would you be able to talk a little bit more about the privacy issues that you, uh, both of you talked about? I remember um, also struggling with whether or not to share certain issues issues of mental health while I was active duty, would you be able to talk a little bit more about why you felt as though you needed to hide or not discuss these kinds of things with your um, chain of command? Uh, Ms. Arana, please. Thank you, Congressman, for the question. Um, I believe that in the military there is still a stigma surrounding this topic. Um, just, you know, even coming here and before I was able to come here and the statement I have to give and make sure that it was understood that these are not the Air Force's views and these are mine personally. Um, it, it makes it really hard and difficult to talk about this. Um, while we say that, you know, I talk, I'm a firm believer we shouldn't be politicizing our health care issues. When I am at work, I can talk about my mental health care issues because that is a thing that's encouraged, you know? Let's be open and let's be transparent and, and let's help one another out. But when we talk about abortion specifically, this is not a topic that is accepted in the office. Um, we don't speak about this. We definitely, it's amongst friends only. Um, you don't advertise it because you don't know who you work for and you don't know what their views are on this. And if you have a supervisor, um, who doesn't support your decisions, it could always come back to you as well and punitively. Um, but yes, it's a very uncomfortable situation to be in. And the fact that we have this culture where our policies also don't support it, that just enforces that stigma, you know? Um, we're not taught to, we're not educated in the military on what our rights and our accesses are with regards to accessing emergency contraceptives or you know, whether it's rape, incest, or life to the mother that you can have TRICARE. Most people don't know this information because we're not told either. And unless we go out as service members, both men and women, seeking this information ourselves um, and doing the homework, it's, it's not advertised to the rest of us. Thank you, and I'm, I'm sorry to uh, interrupt because I only have one more minute. I have one other question for the doctor as well, which is would you speak a little bit to miscarriage uh, and to your experience in this particular uh, very, very common occurrence and how uh, both either active duty women or, or spouses are experiencing that with relationship to abortion access and, and health care? Um, so I can speak to miscarriage care in my state off of base, not having, uh, first of all, restricting abortion access always impacts all pregnancy care. And so the fact that abortion is now illegal in the state of Texas makes pregnancy in general more dangerous. Over the past year, we have been seeing that physicians across the state have been delaying life-saving interventions for miscarriage care mm -hmm. because they are worried about how they intersect with the abortion bans in our state. They've also been delaying life-saving interventions for ectopic pregnancy care, again, because they're worried about how abortion bans intersect with the care of pregnancy complications. So it is, um, it should be a huge concern for service members, service members' spouses that are stationed in states with abortion bans, how they will be treated, and how their lives will be valued throughout their pregnancies. Thank you, my time has expired and I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. Uh, the gentleman is recognized, Mr. Kim, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman. Uh, thank you all for- Excuse me. Um, I apologize, Mr. Fallon has oh. um, joined us, so um, <laughs> we will turn to Mr. Fallon for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I don't have any questions for this panel. Thank you, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from New Jersey is recognized for five minutes. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> um, I just want to say thank you from the outset here uh, for all of you and your testimonies. Um, in the three and a half years or so that I've been here in Congress, I've had a lot of hearings here in this committee room, and I have to say I believe this one to be just, just at the top in terms of the most powerful ones that I've been a part of, um, to be able to hear your stories firsthand, uh, I want to thank you for your willingness to come forward and, and share that with us. 
It's important for us to hear this. For me, I've never served in uniform. I'm not a woman. I'm not a mother. Uh, for me to be able to understand your perspective, um, what you've gone through, your experience, it's invaluable. So I want to say thank you. When I hear your stories, something that really stands out pretty much in every single one is about how some circumstance came about that helped you along this path. Mr. Rana, you talked about how you just happened to be having a trip back to your hometown in Brooklyn. Is that right? And I think Ms. Mozilla uh, mentioned that, you know, just happened that there was, you know, one friend that could bring her forward. And I, I just get really moved by that, that just these circumstances just came about. And, and it just bothers me because it shouldn't have to hinge on just that kind of, for your circumstance, Ms. Rana, just brute luck that you happen to be scheduled. I wanted to ask you, what do you think would have happened had you not had that trip scheduled back home? Thank you for the question. I know what would have happened is um, it would have been one of two things, if I wouldn't have been able, if I would have been forced to carry through with the pregnancy because I was on my way to technical school, to intel officer school in Texas, um, my training either would have been curtailed or I would have been sent to another station. It would have affected the entire path of my career. And Ms. Mozilla, you told the story about how you didn't know very many people there and there was one person that uh, was able to drive you. What, what do you think would have happened had you not met that person, had that person not been willing to help you out? Thank you for your question. I thought about that too many times and many times. I joined the Air Force for an economic step up in a career. Where my life would have went if I didn't have that abortion, I have no idea. And I truly, truly value and credit that abortion provider 19 years ago for where I am today. And I, and I couldn't tell you where my life would be, but I know one thing, I wouldn't be standing here before you today telling my story and trying to make an impact for my fellow service women. Thank you. Well, thank you. It just uh, really hits me because, you know, we're here on this committee trying to make sure that you have the services that you need, the infrastructure you need to be able to then serve our nation. And, and for this, for your own choices to come down to just these these circumstances, these happenstance of, of trips and, and people to be able to help out, it just shows and reinforces to me just how broken of a system, how we failed you in terms of being able to provide you what you needed. Ms. Arana, you were saying that this was all happening when you were graduating from officer training school, is that right? And I'm sure that a, a, a part of that officer training school program was about um, you know, your physical well-being and training and, and, and exercise, is that correct? So obviously, a big part of that was about your health care, about making sure that you're physically fit to be a service member and being able to, to exercise the duties of that position. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Would you say that your health care, when it came to um, having an abortion, that that was something that would have affected your well-being, your health care, your ability to be able to do your duty? Absolutely. I think that, you know, we, as military members, we have a responsibility to remain worldwide deployable. Um, and I think, but yet, when it comes to abortion specifically, we are completely abandoned by the system and left to the luck of where we are stationed, you know. Um, I want to also point out that a lot of our bases right now do not have sufficient obstetrics care for its military members, so even active duty and dependents. And I want to highlight this. This doesn't just affect me and the women in uniform. It affects the family members as well, the dependents. Yep. Um, so we are beholden to civilian services. Um, out of my four kids, only one was born in a military hospital, and the other three were all in civilian hospitals. So it makes this even more prudent, more important to make sure that we are creating an access, a standard of access of care across the board that is completely lacking right now. Well, we should have done better for you, and I hope that this committee can do better for many others that are going to experience these types of challenges going forward. Thank you. Gentleman yields back.